appreciate everybody's time this morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is staying healthy and sane um, and appreciate the time that you're spending with us this morning. I am the security specialist here at, at S&P uh, and work with many of our organizations to try to help better secure uh, their environments. Uh, Veronis is one of our key partners um, and proud to be here with them today to type the anatomy of a cyber attack. Uh, during this session, Ryan will kind of go through two different scenarios, um, one being kind of the external threat and the second one, the insider threat and what kind of what that looks like and how people can navigate through those waters. Uh, but first, just quickly, I uh, wanted to touch base on S&P for not everybody who is aware of S&P, but right now um, we're expanding quite a bit. Uh, we're very thankful to be able to open up a new office in Buffalo uh, here shortly. Uh, but right now we have our headquarters in Rochester, New York. And we also have offices in Burlington, Vermont, Albany and Danbury, Connecticut. 115 employees. And as I said, we're, we're currently uh, increasing and, and expanding, which is fantastic, especially in these, these times that we find ourselves in. Uh, we're really able to do this by focusing on four main pillars. Uh, with our expertise in network data center and collaboration, we bring in a, a kind of a unique approach to security since we have these expertise. Uh, we also have an innovation group that specializes in creating custom automation, uh, which is another differentiator of ours for S&P. And then underneath all that, is our managed services that uh, can assist with securing and, and helping manage people's networks. Uh, we're able really to, to achieve this out of those 115 employees. Uh, about 60 of those are, are engineers and deployment uh, technicians. So again, really bring a unique opportunity to our customers and helping them not only focus on security, but help design the entire uh, infrastructure from beginning to end. So with that, I will hand it off to Ryan and we can dive into this session. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate the intro there and I'm just going to grab the presenter screen. And again, appreciate everybody for joining our session today. My name is Ryan from our security architecture and incident response teams. We get to work with customers every day doing things like investigating alerts, investigating anomalies in their networks, and also helping to operationalize drones from a security perspective, tuning and tweaking threat models, working on threat models from a development perspective too. I, I wanted to take this session to start with just a little bit of a quick level set on Veronis, who we are and what we do and, and how we work. And then we're gonna dive right into our attack scenarios. Um, so we're gonna start with our external threat, actually using Office 365 as an intrusion vector into the organization. And then once we're in, we're gonna transition over to more of an insider threat after moving laterally and talking about how either an external actor or a malicious insider might be able to take advantage of some basic Active Directory uh, vulnerabilities on-prem. And then afterwards, we're gonna jump into my Veronis environment. We'll do a quick investigation and then we'll definitely save some time at the end for some questions. And uh, we'll make sure that we cover all of those as well. So just a quick background on Veronis, who we are and what we do. We have the Veronis data security platform and we really start with a very data centric approach, monitoring all of your core data repositories, really your core unstructured data repositories. So things like your Windows file servers, your Exchange servers, Unix Linux boxes, SharePoint servers on-prem, as well as all of your big NAS arrays out there, like your EMC boxes, your NetApps, your Isilons, anything that we're monitoring from the unstructured data repositories. We're also looking in the cloud. So Office 365, specifically around things like SharePoint Online, OneDrive and Exchange Online. And in addition, we're also looking at a few layers on top of that, things like Microsoft Teams, more of the application layer that sits on top of Office 365, directory services, monitoring both the on-prem Active Directory as well as the in the cloud Azure AD. And then lastly, but not least, the edge services. We're able to pull in additional context from the perimeter by monitoring things like VPN, DNS, and web proxy. So these are really the core platforms or the core data streams that we're ingesting. And in doing so, we're pulling in six unique metadata streams. Right, we have your user group information. This is where we're pulling in all of your user accounts, we're pulling in all of your security groups every single day to start to understand who's a member of what. We combine that with our permissions visibility. This is what actually allows us to see who has access to which components within the environment. On top of that, we add in the content classification where we are where we're actually scanning the contents of those files to let you know where sensitive data sits. And then we have the access activity, the audit trail behind it all, actually allowing us to see who's opening a file, who's modifying a file, who's creating data out there. And then of course, the two pieces of telemetry, the AD telemetry, which I like to kind of think of as the connective tissue around the network. Where do we have users authenticating from devices? Where are they generating 
access request events against other devices. And then of course the perimeter telemetry that allows us to start to see what's coming into and going outside of the network by monitoring those sources like DNS, VPN, and web proxy. And for us, this really boils down into three primary business use cases, data protection, compliance, and threat detection and response. And today, I'm really gonna focus on the threat detection and response aspects. So let's talk a little bit about how we do security analytics here. Uh, for us, it's about starting with the right data streams. You may have mentioned we have a very specific list of what we monitor here. It's very, we're very conscious around the resources that we monitor, around the data streams that we ingest. It gives us full visibility end to end, and we'll talk about some of these threat detection capabilities as we go through the attack scenarios. But for us, it starts with collecting the right data streams. And then we go through a normalization and an enrichment process. So every single event that we collect goes through this enrichment process. And here's a sample of how it goes from a very basic raw log to something a little bit more enriched. And right? instead of just looking at a user opening a file in a location, we're looking at what type of user it is, right? So we're doing account categorization in the background. David Johnson, is this user an executive account? Is it a service account? Is it an admin account? The object, right? It's not just customer.xlsx. It's not just a spreadsheet out there. We want to understand the sensitivity of that spreadsheet by scanning and classifying the data within it. Not just about the source address either, right? We see an IP address there, but we're actively resolving internal IP addresses to hosts. This allows us to start to answer really basic questions like, is it, does it make sense for this user to be on this particular device? And then, of course, our external addresses as well. As we're starting to collect from these external feeds like Office 365 and VPN, as we get external IP addresses, we're starting to enrich them with things like geolocation, showing you where in the world these users are coming from as they're generating this event traffic. So every single event goes through this normalization and enrichment process, and then we start to baseline behavior. This is where more of the analytics side comes into play. Right, we're learning what's normal for every user out there, what type of account it is, what's a typical device for David Johnson to be using. Where is David typically logging in from in the US? What kind of data does David interact with and what kind of, David, what kind of data does David's peers interact with as well? And of course, what's the timing and really starting to build out and baseline this user's behavior. And then this all comes around from our, our detection capabilities. As we're building out our threat models and building out the logic around the threat detection, we're really looking for deviations in behavior. We're looking for where something is going to be different. Right? Where is this user accessing a device that they typically aren't associated with? Where is this user logging in from a new geolocation or a geolocation that maybe they're not usually coming from on a day-to-day -day basis? Where are they interacting with data that they're not typically touching either? And these are all the different threat models that we're designing and we'll walk through some of those together. But a big thing when it comes to the threat detection capabilities for us is learning what's different, right? Where do we have those abnormalities or deviations in behavior? And then our goal is to provide it to you in a very clean and simple format. So anytime we have an alert trigger, you're gonna see summary page like this. The goal is to give you something that you can hopefully ingest and triage in a matter of a couple minutes. We're giving you context as to why the alert triggered, what it's looking like, what are we looking for, how do we understand what's happening, and then what do we do next? Right? How do we quickly move into containment and remediation? phases from here. So just a little bit of background on how we do this at Veronis. Now let's dive into our attack scenarios. We're going to start with our external threat at this point. All right, we're going to talk about using Office 365 as an intrusion vector into the organization. We're actually going to be bypassing multi-factor authentication in this scenario, specifically using Microsoft Authenticator app, so Office 365 MFA. Um, and I think that's an important point to bring up. This is definitely a more sophisticated threat actor that we're talking about here, right? This isn't your average script kid. So here's a quick outline of how the attack is going to work, right? We're gonna start with the external piece. We're gonna be using a man in the middle style of attack to actually bypass MFA and compromise a user session in the cloud, right? This is gonna give us temporary access into the organization. We can start to do things like accessing data across maybe different data repositories like SharePoint Line and OneDrive. We can also use this to start to get into places like users' mailboxes. And this is gonna be the first scenario that we walk through and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And once we get that temporary foothold on the domain, we'll transition into our scenario two next. Right, we're gonna move laterally, we're gonna get an established foothold on-prem and that's gonna give us our persistent foothold. And that's where we move into more of the insider threat approach. Right, This, this could be started from an external actor compromising an account or some of these techniques could also be accomplished by a malicious insider who's done a little bit of homework, done a little bit of research on the back end and has picked up some of these techniques online. 
So once we get on-prem, we're going to be using a little bit of what we would call a modified version of the curve roasting style of attack. We're going to be compromising a service account. That service account is going to be a domain admin that's going to be elevating our privileges. We're going to use that domain admin service account to identify some data on the on-prem rep repositories as well. We're going to bring that data down, and then we're going to actually trade it outside of the network using a very simple approach, really just a third-party webmail like you see here. So let's dive into the first piece of the attack. Right, like all good attacks, we're going to start with a pretty well-crafted phishing email. I, th I think this is probably one of the hardest pieces of the attack. Right, we, we do need a user to click on a link here. And this is what's going to allow us to start our man-in-the-middle style of compromise. So our user clicks on a link. This is going to bring them to what looks like a pretty typical Windows authentication page. But if you have your users authenticating to Office 365, it's going to look like a pretty normal splash page for them. Meanwhile, we're actually going to be sitting man in the middle with our command and control server. In this case, we're running a tool called Evil Jinx that's actually proxying this connection back to the Microsoft Cloud server. So your user is going to type in their credentials. They're going to type in their username. They're going to type in their password. We're going to be capturing that information as it's passed along. We're going to take that valid set of credentials. We'll pass it along to the Microsoft Cloud server. Microsoft is going to see the valid username. It's going to see the valid password. And it's going to send out our pretty typical push notification, right? That SMS message, the push two factor, the code that'll get sent out. Your user's probably going to scan their thumbprint or maybe nowadays use their face ID, right? That's going to validate that they are, in fact, who they say they are. They're going to type the code in. And while this is happening, we're capturing the session token as well, right? This is our temporary intrusion vector into the domain through Office 365. That session token is the already validated user session. It allows us to actually hijack that user session. We're going to be using a developer app to actually import that session token as a cookie into our browser. And that's what then allows us to navigate to the cloud tenant without having to authenticate all over again. So a great way to get into the organization and, and the first piece of our attack scenario here. So let's take a look at how this would actually look. Right after the user clicks on that link, they're going to be brought into this splash page here. Really, I think the, the only dead giveaway is the URL at the top. You'll notice that we actually have a secure certificate. And really, the only thing that would kind of show this off is that no-fish.com domain. But I always like to think about it from the user's perspective. How often are users actually looking at that full URL? Right, so it looks like a pretty normal authentication page. But meanwhile, we're sitting man in the middle. We've captured those credentials. As they're being passed through, we've passed them along to the Microsoft Cloud Server. Microsoft sent out the push notification. You see your code pop up here. Right, your average user is going to authenticate just like they normally would. And then that's going to give them access into something like Outlook or OneDrive or SharePoint Online. Now let's jump over to look at it from the attacker's machine. In this case, we perform this style of attack using a tool called Evil Jinx. Evil Jinx, it's free. It's open source. You can find it online. It's pretty easy to find. There's actually a couple newer versions of it out now, too. Um, something that you could run in, in a Kali Linux server as well. Um, the nice thing is you'll see there with a couple of quick commands, we can actually see the username and the password that were captured. And more importantly, we can also see that we've captured the session token. Right? With another command, I can actually view more details around this specific session token, and I can actually see it there below that I've highlighted. The key with this being we can now export this session token, and I can use something like a developer app to actually import it back into my browser. Right? So I'm going to take it out of my Evil Jinx application. I'm going to move over to my browser. For example, I'm going to use something like Chrome, and I can actually use that to authenticate on behalf of that user. So in this case, we've actually used a developer app. Of course, it has a little bit of a funny name called Eat My Cookie. It allows us to import that session token as a cookie. And now all we really need to do is navigate the organization's cloud tenant. I can navigate to something like Outlook Webmail, I can navigate to something like SharePoint Online or OneDrive, and I'm already validated as that user's session. And you can see we're into the mailbox at this point. All right, so a great way to establish a temporary foothold on the organization, right? A great intrusion vector here. Now keep in mind, I keep bringing up the word temporary. I think that's a very important point to bring up, right? This isn't a persistent foothold at this point. Your more sophisticated threat actors are, they're next gonna wanna try and move laterally and see if they can get on-prem. And that's gonna transition us from the, the first scenario today into more of the second scenario. Um, because this, set, this session token eventually is going to expire. Typically these are gonna last anywhere from eight to 10 hours, depending upon how it's configured within the Microsoft environment. So eventually this session token will run out. 
and your attacker, if they aren't able to establish that persistent foothold, they're going to have to do this all over again. Right? They're going to have to recapture that user set of credentials, perform another man in the middle style of attack, capture the session token all over again, and then have to get in this way and try to move laterally and gain the persistent foothold all over again. So there is a little bit of a, a time crunch here when it comes to our attacker. But of course, right, this does give us temporary access into the Office 365 environment. So we can also do things like access SharePoint Online and OneDrive and start to access data as well. It's really interesting when we're talking about data access in the cloud and, and even data exfiltration in the cloud, something that we won't spend too much time on today, but I think it's a very relevant point to bring up since I've been seeing it in many more organizations recently is the, the usage of shared links. Right? It's really easy for a user, once they're in something like SharePoint Online or OneDrive, they can get their hands on some data and then they can also get that data outside of the network pretty quickly. Right? We're seeing shared links used as an exfiltration technique it's a little bit more subtle than your average email being sent back out. So something to be mindful of as we're moving our users to the cloud, as we're kind of enabling more Office 365 usage out there, we need to be conscious of shared link usage as well. Where do we have users who are sharing links publicly or sharing links externally because it's a great data exfiltration tactic. And speaking of the shared links, it's also a great way that we can start to move laterally and see if we can gain that persistent foothold on-prem. So what I'm actually going to do next is navigate over to SharePoint Online and I'm going to use this to start to transition into my second scenario. Right? We're going to move laterally here and we want to gain the persistent foothold. And in order to do that, we're actually going to upload a malicious payload. So we're going to upload a Word doc into SharePoint Online. That Word doc contains a malicious payload, malicious macro embedded in the background. And then we're going to start to you might call it fish other users internally. But we're not fishing users with an email like you may have seen in the past. We're going to be using shared links to start to send that document out around the organization, guessing that one of these users is going to click on that link. They're going to open up that document, and in turn, they're going to run the macro that's embedded in the Word doc, which allows us to establish a reverse shell session on that machine, thus giving us more persistent foothold onto the device. Right? We're at that point, we're able to compromise the workstation on-prem. We've compromised that user's account, and we'll transition into the second scenario today, the second piece of our attack. So let's take a quick look at how this would actually look. It's very simple. It's, it's as quick and easy as a quick drag and drop, right? So we've uploaded our sales update doc here. That actually contains the malicious payload in the background. We're just going to hit the ellipsis. We can hit our shared links here. The nice thing about Office 365 is it does a lot of the recon for me. So I type in the word managers. It starts to auto-populate my manager's members. I'll put a nice little note that's associated with this document. Hey, say, hey, please take a look at this when you get a chance. And then we're going to send that out to everybody who's a member of my manager's group. And I'm going to say there's a, a pretty good chance probably one of those users is going to receive that email with a shared link within it. They're going to click on that link, and then they're going to open up that Word doc. It looks like a pretty normal shared link here. In this case, we've actually sent that out and, and done a little bit of an internal fish to our CMO. But they're going to click on the link. It's going to open up the Word doc. Looks like a pretty normal Word doc. Hit that yellow enable editing button at the top, just like they typically do. And in doing so, runs that malicious macro embedded in the background, thus allowing us to compromise that user's workstation. Right, and this moves us out of this scenario one, the intrusion vector, into more of our scenario two, what are we gonna do next now that we're on the inside? So let's take a quick transition. Right now, we've looked at this mostly through a recreation. I'm gonna now transition over to my lab environment, and we're gonna go through the internal component together share out this other screen. So now moving on to scenario two, or the part two of the scenario here. Uh, we're now on the internal side. Right, we've compromised this user's workstation. We've established our foothold on-prem. We can now start to execute some commands remotely, execute some, some shell sessions remotely. And we've put together a couple of different utilities to show off how an attacker might be able to do this, or in some cases, how a malicious insider might be able to do this as well. And we're actually gonna be using two different utilities that we've built with a little bit of a package through PowerShell scripting. So the, the first piece of this insider scenario is gonna be a bit of what we might, might call a modified Kerberosting style of attack. So we're going to be opening up our Kerber roasting script here. And this is something that we're seeing very commonly nowadays, with pen testing as well. Um, if anybody's familiar with the Kerber roasting attack, the first aspect of this, we're actually going to be querying for our SPN valued service accounts. 
right, the SPN value, service principal name, it's an AD attribute, everybody's got them. You can kind of think of it as a, an alias between the service account and the service that that account is running. Classic example would be something like your SQL instances out there. Anytime you spin up a SQL server, you're installing those SQL services on that box. And in doing so, you're assigning an account to run those services. This assigns the SPN value to that account and allows us to do a lot of the really basic Windows and network authentication that we do day in and day out. Right? It allows normal domain users to authenticate to those services. So it's not a bad thing. This is actually something that everybody needs to have, but it's also something that as an external threat actor, we can start to take advantage of too. So running these commands remotely, I can do something like running set spn.exe with a couple flags set, and I can start to query for all of my SPN value service accounts within domain within the domain. Right, so I can see those service principal named accounts here. I see the services and the accounts that are running them. But not only do I want to view these services, I also want to see if I can compromise one of these users. So what I'll do next is actually request access to those services. And if we're thinking about Kerberos authentication, in requesting access to a service, I'm requesting a TGS or a service ticket. Now the key there being each of those service tickets actually contains the respective password hash of that account within it. And then using something like a memory scraper, a classic example might be something like Mimikatz, I can actually dump or export those service tickets. So I'll pull them out of memory, pull them out of the LSAS process, and I can export, save them locally here on my workstation. This is our desktop one machine. Now we don't need to go after all of these users. Right? If I do want to compromise an account, starting with a, a service ticket or a TGS is, is probably a great way to go. Because I have the ticket, I can maybe do something like a pass the ticket attack. I also now have the password hash that's located within the ticket because it's an SPN valued account, but I still want to be smart about this attack, but I want to be efficient about my scenario here. So what I'll do next is a little bit of reconnaissance internally, right? I'm going to run just a quick LDAP query and I've simply asked the question, which of these accounts is a member of my domain admins group, right? Domain admins, I'm guessing that's probably going to give me the access that I need to get into some sort of sensitive data repository. And I get three accounts that come back backup service, IT admin, and proxy you. Now in theory, I can go after any of these accounts, right? I know their username, I have their password hash, I know their domain admins, but I'm thinking backup service is probably the right account for me, right? I'm guessing if they're running daily or nightly backups, they're probably not changing the password too frequently on that account. And guessing if, you know, it, that's gonna get, give me A, want enough time to actually crack that password hash and compromise that set of credentials and B, also give me enough time to actually use that set of credentials around the network before the password's changed on me. I'm also thinking if there's any sort of inline network monitoring capability and maybe network UVA capability out there, something like a backup account accessing a data repository like a file server, probably not gonna set off too many warning bells. So I think that's the right account for me. I'm actually gonna make that selection. And in doing so, I'm gonna take that service ticket and I'll load it into my good friend here, John the Ripper. I'm sure a lot of you out there are familiar with John the Ripper. It's Pretty commonly used in pen testing scenarios. It's free, it's open source, you can find it online, usually the first or second link with a quick Google search. Maybe you wouldn't do that on your corporate machines today because I might get in trouble for suggesting it. But in this case, we're trying to crack a password hash. A password hash, it's a one-way mathematical algorithm. We can't reverse a password hash, but we can look for a hash collision. We can compare hash values together and look for a match. And that's what we're doing here, right? So we're iteratively looking through a list of hundreds of thousands and millions of clear text passwords. We're averaging a little over 275,000 passwords per second. So moving quite quickly through this list here, looking for that match between the two hash values. Once we do have that match, that's when we'll know we have the clear text version of our password. And I think a really important nuance to bring up with what we're doing here today and how we're doing this so quickly and effectively. I didn't mention it at the time, but back when I had requested access to those services and gotten those service tickets, I had actually done so by forcing a downgraded form of encryption. And instead of using our standard AES-256 level of encryption when it comes to password hashes or Kerberos authentication, I forced downgraded RT4 encryption, which is something that we see very commonly in pen testing scenarios as well. Right, backwards compatibility, most people still have RC4 encryption enabled out there. And it's a great way to get a much weaker password hash. And that's what, that's what actually allows me to crack this password hash in a matter of 43 seconds here, as opposed to maybe a couple hours or a couple days. You can see our password for our backup service account is password one with an at sign. And hopefully we're not using that password out there and you're probably thinking to yourself, who would ever use that, right? But let's think about it. It's a nine character password with a special character and a number. 
really not too far outside the realm of a pretty typical password policy that we see in a lot of organizations today. So at this point, right, we've compromised our second user here. We've compromised our backup account. This time we know it's a domain admin. I'm done with this utility for now. And next I'm gonna run my file crawler utility, the second script that we've built. And I'm actually gonna run this with my new set of credentials over the network. So I'm gonna run it with my backup credentials here. My new username and my new password. And I like to think of this file crawler utility as kind of a, a big fancy control F, right? the find function. Hopefully we're all familiar with that. Right? You have your PDFs or your Word docs and you hit find and you'll get a nice little pop-up that allows us to start to index the text within that document. And we're doing something actually similar here, but we're doing it at scale. So using PowerShell string searches, I can start to index all the files found within certain repositories that I point this script at. So in this case, I'm running this as my backup service account, right, which I know is a domain admin on the network. I've pointed this at my finance director. I've done a little bit more recon in the background, right? I've pointed this at my finance repository located on my file share out there. And now I just need to type in some keywords or some terms, things that I want to look for in order to identify some interesting or sensitive data. If I'm looking for things like maybe insider financial information, something that might be worth my while to take outside of the network, I might be looking for things like bank account numbers, or routing numbers, socials, maybe tax IDs, all good things to look for. It's gonna to start to index all the files found within Share Finance. And it's gonna give me a nice report of which of these files actually contain any of those hits. I will give it a second here. And if we're talking about a real life scenario, right, we might be doing this for days or weeks at a time, pointing this at different directories, looking for different keywords, looking for different terms, looking for different areas of the network all in an effort to do a little bit more reconnaissance and identify some insider, or maybe some potentially sensitive financial data. And you're gonna see here, it looks like maybe just right around 11 files that have come back, things like 2020 plan in my customers folder, customers full list, marketing plans, finance reports, Q1 through Q4 of 2018, all good pieces of information to identify. Right, what I wanna do next is not only look at these documents, I'm gonna download this data. I'll save it locally on my endpoint you'll see it show up as that temp file directory. And what we'll do from here is actually take that temp folder and we're gonna zip it up, we'll encrypt it and we're gonna password protect it. Because then we're gonna start thinking about how do we get this data outside of the network. So now we've crafted our payload, we have our data staged and ready to go out. And we can talk about the final stage of our attack scenarios today, the data exfiltration component. All right, we talked a little bit about that before through the usage of shared links. I wanna talk a little bit more about it now from the usage of an internal user. Right? When we talk about data exfiltration, a lot of different ways that we can get data outside of the network. And some more sophisticated threat actors may be using something like perhaps DNS tunneling, pretty low and slow APT-esque technique where we're actually tunneling bits of data outside of the network using DNS requests. In a case like this, if we're talking about maybe your more average user, maybe more of a technical insider, a malicious insider, I think there's also a much simpler way that we can get data out as well. Maybe this is on your user's endpoint or your workstation. Oftentimes we have access to things like Gmail or Dropbox or LinkedIn or Facebook, places where we can start to send data out of the network quite easily. And I'm sure we've probably all seen somebody do this at some point in their lives, hopefully not to steal corporate data, of course. But I'm just going to log into my Gmail account here, scveronis at gmail.com. I'm going to send myself an email. We're going to hit compose. We're going to send it to Verona SSE. We'll call it top secret so nobody else knows to look inside of it. And I'll just drag and drop this private.zip folder over. And really, before this message is even sent, this draft is saved, that attachment is uploaded, that data is already outside of the network. I'm going to hit send anyway just for good measure. And you can see it'll show up in my inbox. And now I can go on with my day. Maybe a couple more things to do this afternoon, close my session here. Later on, I can jump onto my personal machine, jump into that Gmail account, and I can download that data outside of the network. So this about wraps up the attack piece of the demonstration today. I'm gonna to quickly transition over into my Veronis environment. And while I do that, just a quick recap of what we looked at so far, because we touched on a lot of different topics. Right, we first spoke about intrusion into the organization by using MFA and, and Office 365 as a way to get in. We saw that man in the middle style of attack, that malicious actor getting in through the MFA bypass there. 
once they got in, they had their temporary foothold on the domain. At that point, we were able to start to access some data. We decided to move laterally. We got our persistent foothold on-prem. Once we got to the on-prem data repositories, right? once we got to that on-prem workstation, we switched gears a little bit. And then that could either be established through the external actor or could be more of an insider threat scenario. But at that point, we started to see if we can compromise another user internally. Right, we compromised our backup service account. From there, we used our backup service credentials to access some data across one of our file servers, that data repository. We looked for the financial data. We downloaded that data, we saved it locally there, and then we exfiltrated the data outside of the network using a pretty simple method today. And now for the last couple of minutes, we've jumped over to my Veronis environment, and I wanna give you a quick look at into some of the threat detection capabilities that we're designing around these scenarios, right? A couple of the threat models that we're building here. Now, I know not everybody is familiar with the Veronis interface. I'll start with just a quick overview. This is our alert dashboard. This is where we can start to see, see the alerts at a very high level. We have a couple filters here at the top. You'll see number of alerts per day, color-coded by severity at the top. We have our top alerted users who's triggered the alerts. We have our top alerted devices, the source devices of the activity, top alerted threat models, all the different threat models are the alerting logic behind the alerts that you see here. Now, all of the models that you'll see today actually come out of the box. These are all pre-built for you, predefined, uh, and we'll take a look through a couple of those as well. As we get down here below and we start to talk about things like top alerted assets, these are the affected objects, alerts with geolocation information. As we were talking about some of those external data repositories and the enrichment process, right? When we're capturing things like external IP addresses, part of that basic enrichment is to show you where in the world those events are coming from. And as we talk about our man in the middle style of attacks, and as we talk about how somebody might be able to compromise a user in Office 365, the geolocation is gonna become very important. This allows us to start to see where do we new geolocations for users, or maybe even something like what we call a geo hopping alert, where you might have a user logged in from two different places in the world at the same time. And then of course, down here at the bottom, we have our kill chain analysis. Each threat model has a category assigned to it, and the various categories align to the different stages of our kill chain here. So you'll see this provides some structure and some framework to the various alerts that have triggered. And for me, very basic investigation, we'll jump over here to our analytics pane. We can start to see the different alerts that have triggered over the past day. You'll start to see the different threat models, and I'm just gonna pick a couple here, for example, investigation. Right. Sorting by our timeline, we can start to see this builds out a bit of this scenario. Right? We start to see things like our potential ticket harvesting attack. This comes from our directory services monitoring. And pulling in the events from the directory, we're starting to analyze where do we have those TGS requests? Where do we have users requesting access to different services? We're also looking for downgraded form of encryption. Right? In a case like this, we had compromised that engineer account on the desktop one machine. That user had clicked on our phishing link. Right? This user then went out and started to request access to all of our different SPN valued service accounts. And we can see here that it triggered an alert because we had a spike in the number of services being requested access to within a certain period of time, five of services within one minute. We also see the downgraded or forced form of encryption, the RC4 encrypted password hashes as opposed to the standard AES that we see day in and day out for this particular user. We'll have some background here with our risk assessment insights, a little bit of background on the user who triggered the alert, right, engineer. Do we know whether or not this account had any changes made in the past seven days? Do we have this account on the watch list? Any other alerts by this account in the past seven days? All good things to be mindful of. We have our devices insight. We can start to see the source device of the activity. So desktop one, that was the machine that we were on. We can see that it typically does, in fact, belong to our user engineer. You can see down here below the timing of the alerts as well. I'm actually running this a little bit ahead of ourselves here um, off of UTC zero. But of course, if we want to really get down into the nitty gritty detail behind it, with a quick click, you'll be able to dive into the events that triggered the alert. Here we can see directory services access request activity. This is all coming from the domain controller. We can start to understand which services were granted access to. Okay, we'll see the timestamp, we'll see the user, we'll be able to see the device that the user came from and start to paint this picture, start to build out this story a little bit. And that was the first alert that had triggered from our Kerberos thing style of attack. If we jump back in here to our last seven days, we'll see that follow up with a service account log on to a personal device for the first time. Right? This is when we had used that backup service account to interact with some of our data. We had logged in through our shell session on our desktop one machine. And then at this point, we had also used our service account to access some data. I think this is probably one of the most important pieces of our investigation, understanding 
the data layer audit trail, right? Understanding the file level access here. And we not only see abnormal service behavior access to atypical files, but we also see a layer of sensitivity to it. Abnormal service behavior access to atypical folders containing GDPR data. So not only do we know that this is a service account accessing data in an atypical location, we also know that there are some GDPR components as well. We see here the finance data, we see backup service, this time the impacted user on engineer's machine desktop one because that was our channel to the file server. We see the data impact, nine of these 13 objects are classified as sensitive outside of the typical working hours for our service account. And then of course we can dive into the file level audit trail here and actually understand each file open event, right? Which users interacting with which data sets in the particular locations and the sensitivity of that as well. This is really great from a forensics perspective, start to piece this back together. And then of course, the last two pieces of this scenario, right? Talking about data exfiltration, this is where we can start to monitor things like the proxy transactions. Where do we see a service account accessing the internet for the first time, our backup account on that same machine? And then where do we see our service account uploading an unusual amount of data to email websites. In this case, I'd done it through Gmail. I'd uploaded that private.zip folder as an attachment. We can see here over 17 megs of data uploaded to mail.google.com, exceeding this user's normal behavior. We see the spike in traffic, the user on the same machine. We can continue to piece this storyline along and start to build out this particular scenario. So just a really quick investigation into a couple of these threat models. You can see that we're monitoring a couple of different areas of this particular attack scenario today, today, monitoring the Active Directory component, the Windows component, as well as the proxy logs. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I'm gonna wrap up my side. Um, one, one last thing I wanted to kind of transition over to is talking a little bit about what Veronis is doing today. We have a lot of things that we're, we're offering out there specifically around monitoring different data sets within the environment. So feel free to, to reach out to us at any point. We are offering free incident response services. So if you ever do have a question around events or alerts that you're seeing, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to jump on a remote session, start to dive through that together. We're offering extended trials across things like Office 365 and Team Security, your perimeter telemetry, including VPN, DNS, and web proxy monitoring, as well as your directory services monitoring. So on-prem active directory and in the cloud Azure AD. At this point, I think I'll probably it back along Jonathan yeah thank you Ryan so uh, hope you found that uh, beneficial uh, appreciate Ryan and his time here um, as Ryan said you know we're definitely here to help so please feel free to reach out with any questions um, I believe we do have some time for questions now if there's any out there I don't know if there's any in the queue at the moment here I don't see any let me just take a, okay there is one what other type of attack vectors do you monitor so i i could probably take that one jonathan so that, that that's a great question um we're monitoring a lot of different intrusion vectors and it depends on the resource that we're using to monitor it um, this is just one specifically around office 365 we also have brute force models that are very common Especially on the IR side, we're seeing a lot of brute force attacks today, both on VPN and also things like Office 365. Um, when it comes to insider threats, it's something that happens internally, right? We had the one that we had seen around the curb roasting attack, that was the ticket harvesting. We also have models that are designed around things like pass the ticket attacks. We also have models designed around network enumeration of devices. So we have a lot of threat models that come out of the box. I think in our latest release, we have over 150. So we would love to maybe even have a follow-up session. We can walk through some of those as well. And we have other scenarios that we can walk through together. Great, thank you, Ryan. Give a couple more seconds for any other questions that might pop up. Great, yeah, there was just one about the, the recording of this um, session. And yes, we will be sure to make that available and um, likely it will be posted on SMP's events page where we have a number of our previous webinar recordings available. Great. Let's see, there is one more. Considering perimeter, uh, perimeter monitoring and web services, do you have SQL service monitors for blind SQL injection? Another good question there, and, and I can grab that one. So. Keep in mind, we're not necessarily monitoring uh, 
database servers today in the sense of actually monitoring the, the databases themselves, right? So we're really focusing on the unstructured data repositories, but in monitoring things like directory services and, and some of those perimeter telemetries, we are able to see the authentication activity. So we do have threat models that are designed around SQL injection, as well as cross-site scripting attempts, but we'll see that coming in through the authentication activity. So if somebody were to try to perform some of this, uh, maybe one of these attacks against like an open web server or something open externally that authenticated back to AD or authenticated back through the VPN, that's where we would pick it up, not necessarily by monitoring the SQL server directly. You know, it was a question about, let's see, um, are some Verona's capabilities limited to Office 365? Any plans to expand to Google G Suite? Another good question. So when it comes to the cloud monitoring today, we're primarily focused around Office 365 and Box. Um, G, G Suite not supported today, but a roadmap item. So hopefully coming soon. I didn't see any others come across there. I think that, uh, I think we're good. So um, with that, I'm gonna end recording. Thank you so much everyone for attending. Yes, thank you everybody. Yesterday. I hope everybody stays safe and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Have a good day, everybody.